Now we're going to start the presentation by Don Sri Arora. The title of the presentation is Jupiter Under the Hood. The presentation is going to be about, for, Jupiter, oh, Jupiter. About, about how it came to be and this wonderful, wonderful piece of software that we all use. Before that, uh, I want to... I know uh, I can't see any of you right now who were listening to the talk, but thank you for tuning in anyway. Um, <clears throat> I would like to ask the audience how many of you have ever written like a custom extension or a widget for Jupiter, or even wrote your own line magic? Uh, really, how, how many of you like uh, have ever wondered what goes on into making what a Jupyter Notebook is. So why this talk? As I mentioned, it's a fascinating piece of software and it's truly language agnostic. We'll see what that means. And a little bit of a uh, segue into why it's really called Jupyter. That's because the, some of the popular languages that it started out supporting when it was when it was conceived was Julia, Python, and R. So it's kind of like a play on those languages. And it's also essentially interactive computing on steroids, right? Like you can do anything from raw inputs to very interactive plots and widgets. And of course, it's redefined scientific computing and reproducible, collaborative, shareable research. So essentially, like it's redefined the last decade of how scientific computing has looked for many of us. So what's, and personally, before I move on, I kind of started uh, going down this rabbit hole of what makes Jupiter Jupiter is I had this one interesting uh, problem to solve at the place I was working last, uh, wherein we were trying to create a self-contained uh, Jupyter environment for data exchange between um, a data provider and a data user in a private environment. Yes, we were a company working on uh, privacy enhancing technologies and so on. And now, once we developed this platform, we were like, okay, how do we really write tests? Because as a good engineer, you always write, write tests. And so the idea came into being like, okay, well, we've, we've written unit tests and all, but like we want to write an integration test. So how do we really automate a Jupyter notebook? Okay, but for automating, we really need to understand what the notebook really is. So that's kind of where this deep dive started. Um, yes, so what's in this talk? Any one of you might this is a talk bit of a for you. Uh, if a different interface for presentations, uh, and I should mention I'm using Rise, uh, the very fun library, Python library that's packed away all the nitty-gritty of the Reveal.js uh, JavaScript library into a nice Python package, which is letting me build a note, which is letting me build a presentation on a notebook. So isn't that really cool? Um, so yeah, what's in this talk for you? We're going to understand the architecture of a widely used and loved software. We're also going to look at ZMQ, which is the core of the generalized Jupyter networking protocol. Never mind that jargon if that didn't make sense. Uh, but the crux is that this is what makes Jupyter distributed, scalable, and language agnostic. As in, you have the same notebook interface that can support many different languages few of which we already looked at, Julia, Python, and R. But hell, like it even has support for Ansible for, you know, you DevOps engineers out there, like if you want to just use the friendly Jupyter interface and you're just going to code out an Ansible playbook, 
by all means, give it a go. So, yeah. Um, so I would go back to the earlier use case where I wanted to see if I could programmatically create and execute a notebook. But of course, like quite unsurprisingly, the Project Jupyter team already had a sophisticated uh, tool built out for the situation. Um, but since this wise man or this fine man, should I say, uh, once said, you know, you haven't really understood something complex unless you're able to go ahead and explain it and really like get it to work. So we're gonna try that here. Um, okay, so let's go right ahead. But before we dive into that, I would like to share some history. So how did uh, Jupiter or its ancestor, IPython came into being? Well, it started as an afternoon hack in 2001 or uh, by by a person called Fernando Perez, uh, this great software developer slash physicist. Um, and it was a thesis procrastination for him, as he likes to put it, but I'm sure that's not the case. Uh, and fast forward to 10 years, the first IPython notebook is released, which is which has with the QD console support. Uh, and uh, support for interactive widgets, and also like a browser support uh, in the form of publishing notebooks and such. Uh, now, what really IPython was, was just a very fancy REPL, which is read eval print loop, um, which allowed you to do code introspection, code completion, uh, object introspection and a bunch of that fun stuff. Uh, but now you have all this in amazing tooling built around it that's allowing you to use it with uh, a, a GUI, a nice GUI through the browser or through the QD console and so on. But, and, and the architecture of this IPython notebook, it was realized that is, was not like was, was very scalable and provided this modular sort of an uh, approach wherein you could uh, build support for other languages into it. So essentially the IPython kernel um, could then, you know, could, all, could also be, uh, the same idea of the IPython kernel could also be extended to say a Julia kernel or an R kernel. And so then it was realized that it's kind of, um, kind of ambiguous to keep calling it IPython because it supports more than one language. And so there was the big split that was announced in the SciPy 2014 conference, which essentially abstracted the generalized networking protocol, allowing more language agnostic features and more languages and several other frameworks and things to be supported under the whole Jupyter umbrella. So as I mentioned previously, IPython and Jupyter, the differences are IPython is just an interactive Python shell and kernel for the Python language. But Jupyter is everything else, the network protocol, the NB format, which is the format for storing uh, Jupyter notebooks on your file system or anywhere, uh, NB convert, which is a util utility for um, converting a notebook document across several other file formats, LaTeX, RAS, um, HTML, PDF, you may have already seen and used them, and a lot of other fancy extensions and widgets. One of those extensions being RISE that I'm already using and I told you about. Um, so yeah, uh, if you're ever wondering what exactly is the difference between IPython and Jupyter, because this is still a question that gets asked quite often, uh, this is what it is. IPython is all Python, Jupyter, everything else. But let's see what really Jupyter is in a nutshell. Um, it's, I'm going to revive the Swords United meme here. Uh, it's IPython, ZMQ library, and a Tornado server. We'll see what this Tornado server really is doing here and where it fits into the picture, where it fits into the bigger picture. So in a nutshell, when you, the user, 
opens a notebook in your browser, uh, the notebook interface that you see is essentially creating HTTP and web sockets with the notebook server, which is written, which is basically written as a tornado server. And this notebook server is responsible for talking to the kernel. Now, this kernel, as I mentioned, could be an, a Python kernel, kernel, could be a Julia kernel, could be an Ansible kernel, kernel if you wish. And this notebook server is also responsible for taking care of all your notebook file and its related assets and artifacts. And this is essentially the main architecture, which was then also adapted into a multi-user or like um, architecture or uh, kind of a thing in say like Jupyter on the cloud. Uh, for example, like if, if any of you have used Jupyter Hub or Binder uh, or sort of like related to, uh, relating to, uh, related tooling around the Jupyter uh, ecosystem. So to recap, you open a browser, it opens uh, HTTP and web sockets with the notebook server, and the server uses those sockets to communicate uh, with the kernel using ZMQ uh, patterns and sockets, which we'll look at later. And with that, we can go on and show what the notebook document is. Yes, I know that can seem quite underwhelming, but that's it. It's just a JSON. It's just a JSON with those four fields. Uh, it's your cells, a list of your cells, which could be your code cells or markdown cells, um, some metadata, uh, which can be, you know, which language you're using, which kernel the notebook is written for, uh, and the, the format version, and so on. That metadata, for example, would also carry information about uh, the extensions that you're using, for example, the Strize extension, I can define, I can define like my slide transition themes and slide theme and background and all of that stuff, you know, in the metadata. And, and so that makes it pretty nifty and pretty useful for storing all your information in about a notebook in a single JSON. And this generally like renders as an IPy NB file on your file system, which we'll see later. So a little more nuanced look into the notebook server. Like I mentioned before, you have the server app um, and your notebook also has like a bunch of configuration, you know, like you could set custom tokens, you could set custom passwords, you could enable, disable uh, some features and all of that configuration managed and taken care of by the server app. I mean, it, it, needs to know that configuration to run your notebook. Um, and then it's talking to a bunch of other tools, uh, which is your Jupyter client uh, or your uh, kernel manager or your session manager, just taking care of um, no uh, sort of serializing any of the information related to your Jupyter notebook in or like your session in in a in a database and uh, the client that's going to take your input or take your input sort of like communicating requests or take your code execution requests and sort of like give them the result of those executions and um other requests back to you um yeah so let's let's see with that information. Let's try to communicate with the server, uh, with the tornado server, and let's get some information about this current session that we're running right now. And let's see what that gets us. So here I am just um, querying the notebook API, uh, the sessions API in particular, and. Uh, I have to mention that I have run this notebook without a token and a password and disabling some other checks. So if you were doing this um, with a secure notebook with the token or password enabled, you would see a few extra parameters in this query. So let's see. Ah, okay. Uh, turns out I have actually not started it with 
uh, the password and token disabled. Uh, but uh, I will, uh, before I upload these slides, I will start it uh, in the more intended manner and leave the output for you guys to see it later. Uh, but yeah, even with this, you can see that Jupyter is doing its job. It, it recognizes this request as something that's not authorized. And so it's giving you a 403. So we, we know that at least it's doing one of its jobs. So it's great. Um, so let's look at ZMQ socket types and patterns. Uh, so as promised, uh, we will, uh, we're going to look at some of the ZMQ nuggets that we talked about. Um, so ZMQ has a bunch of socket types, uh, one of them being your standard request and reply. Uh, request is generally a client socket, which connects to a, a server. Um, and the replying socket is going to bind uh, the replying socket is generally going to be a server, which is going to bind at a port, and the requesting socket is going to initiate a client request with, to which the server is going to reply. And then you can see that it's going to get stuck in a receive reply cycle. That is, a replying socket cannot initiate communication before a requesting socket actually requests something. Now, with this, there's also going to be no fair queuing. That is, if a requesting socket comes in with a very large request or a very computer resource intensive request, uh, the server is going to kind of going to get stuck in responding to that request. And um, it's not really useful, as you can see, in a multi client or a collaborative scenario. The other socket type that ZMQ provides is PubSub, which is um, your publisher and subscriber when a publisher produces. Uh, it can be an infinite stream and a subscriber just consumes um, either by a topic or by consuming everything from that infinite stream. Uh, and this is probably something you might have encountered while uh, working with even native socket, like working with sockets or any any um, web socket uh, protocol, even in Python. And finally, we have the final uh, socket type, socket pair type of interest is the dealer and router socket type. Now, one thing to note with, and, and this is super interesting, uh, the dealer can bind or connect the router can also bind or connect, whereas still the dealer is similar to a client in most cases. Uh, but one of the more interesting things about the socket pair is especially the router socket, which tracks all the sockets that it's connected to. And you can see that in a multi-user or multi-client environment, this is especially important because if you have multiple clients and if you're only using request reply sockets, the, the, the server is not going to be able to tell which like client to send the information to, or like at least it's not going to be like uh, distinguish or, uh, or if it won't be able to tell other clients what you know one client is doing and which you want in a collaborative environment. Uh, and so this socket pair creates a lot of flexibility for the user uh, in that, you know, messages can be received from anywhere and sent anywhere. And there's also going to be fair queuing uh, in the request receipt and in the, in the client requests. Now let's see how this actually plays out in the Jupyter messaging protocol or the Jupyter network protocol that we talked about. So you can uh, see this in the, you can um, check out this link here for more in, uh, for in-depth uh, documentation on the messaging protocol in Jupyter. But essentially, let's first look at this uh, front end and 
IPython kernel interaction. So a front end is, you know, your keyboard, your mouse, whether you're typing the raw input or you're interacting with a widget, it's going to, it's it's essentially going to uh, raise the request through the dealer router, uh, and it's going to send that to the server. It's, it's this kernel proxy, which is being taken care of by this Jupyter server, is going to create a request, which is then going to go to um, the the. The the server here it's 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 essentially the IPython kernel that's so if perhaps your IPython kernel is going to like uh create a request suppose it's trying to you know like it it's it's perhaps trying to prompt you for input and it's perhaps trying to give you an error or something the IPython kernel is going to open the router socket and create a request to the dealer socket, and which, as per our knowledge of the dealer router socket, it enables request reply in any direction. Um, and suppose you try to open an interactive input. Um, say you have like a raw input command or you have a vid or a response widget here in it uh your front end is going to open a dealer socket which is going to create that request reply sort of a loop with the ipython kernel and it's going to sort of your your ipython kernel is going to like keep asking the front end for more inputs over this dealer router socket. Uh, now you also see that there is a pub sub socket pair here, which is essentially suppose, you know, your uh, suppose your request produces a side effect. Um, maybe you're printing a statement, maybe your uh, code runs into an error and all that side effect information needs to be published and it needs to be published to all the clients. That happens over this pub sub socket pair. Uh, we also need to note that the kernel can be connected to more than one front end simultaneously, which allows for the collaborative environment that we talked about. Now, these messages, they essentially kind of look like this, wherein you would every message would carry a header uh, with its own unique ID, uh, its own session ID. And if it was created and um, it if if uh, it was in response to some other request, so it would also carry the data related to that request in the parent header. Um so this messaging sort of also involves a bunch of channels. One of those, uh, and there are a few of these channels, which we, which I'm not going to talk uh, cover here in this talk, but you can check them out in the documentation that's linked here. So one of those channels is the shell channel. Uh, it's essentially a router socket that receives incoming in connections or um, for, and, and this is the router socket on the kernel that's going to receive, on the IPython kernel that's going to receive inco incoming connections for say code execution or tab completion, introspections, and even prompts. And then the communication proceeds as a sequence of request reply actions. Then you're going to have the IOPUB channel, which is going to be a pub sub mechanism for broadcasting side effects, which we looked at. Um, and then it's also going to communicate with all the clients over the shell channel. Uh, you know, so when you see uh, when one uh, client creates a request which keeps the kernel busy, the other clients also sort of see that the kernel is busy. That sort of communication also takes place on this channel. 
Now let's look at another channel of interest, which is the standard input. Now this is the dealer socket, uh, the dealer router socket pair for interactive input, uh, which we saw earlier. And this is essentially important for things like raw input and widgets and such. Uh, now let's see if we can dump or create a, a notebook with the metadata that with the with the notebook format that we saw earlier in the talk. And yes, we are going we are able to create a notebook. Now let's see if you know we can we actually have that notebook existing. And we see that we do. And it also renders as a new notebook, which is great. Um, now there was a couple of other things that I wanted to show, but since I have not started the notebook without a token and password, etc., this code is not going to work. So apologies for that. Um, but so far, if you guys have any questions, I would like to take those questions at this point. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, so there is uh, one question on Slido right now. Um, is ZMQ a protocol built on top of HTTP that Tornado deals with, or is it a lower level protocol replacing HTTP and Tornado, and Tornado can deal with it in addition to HTTP? It's a lower level protocol. It's basically a buyer level protocol that's not built on top, top of HTTP at all. In fact, one could argue that um, HTTP, uh, especially like HTTP long polling or HTTP um, or like a WebSocket uh, connection are the higher level protocols that make use of lower level protocols like ZMQ. In fact, think of ZMQ not in relation to HTTP, but in relation to messaging or message queuing. Uh, so if you have heard of uh, things like AMQP or, you know, RabbitMQ, those are the successors of ZMQ, also created by uh, Peter Hinton, the guy behind ZMQ. So think of ZMQ in relation to that. Yeah, uh, any, uh, do we have any other questions? It uh, doesn't look like there's any questions, any additional questions at the moment. So uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Sorry. Oh, sorry, one, one more question just came in. Uh, so Tornado or some other ZMQ compatible server is an essential, is essential and is not switchable like the kernels behind the scenes. Um, I think it is switchable, but uh, the thing with Jupyter is that it's largely legacy code at this point. You could also argue that you could switch out ZMQ for the newer messaging, message queuing libraries, but the code base is 10 years old and it's massive. Like, I don't, I, it's, it's, and also like used by a lot many people. So I think that's going to be like a fairly difficult task. Uh, although, if I recall correctly, there was work underway trying to replace Tornado with uh, another server because you have a bunch of uh, server frameworks for Python, right? Uh, a bunch of server, a bunch of asynchronous server frameworks for Python, um, which is Tornado. Uh, uh, I think um, I don't remember the one that's uh, also being used by Fast API recently, but yeah, it's it's more of a legacy thing at this point than anything else, I think. Okay, thank you very yeah. much. Uh, I don't see any more new questions at this time, so we'll, uh, we'll end the presentation here. So everybody, please give a big round of applause to the speaker.
And if you have any more questions for the speaker, uh, you can interact on the uh, Slack PyCon 2022 JP Fellow 2022 channel. Thank you.